Mr. Chancellor, thank you so much for making time in your busy schedule for us. Good morning. So I read your biographer says you don't often answer directly, but I'm going to try my best today. Um, you speak with Vladimir Putin. Do you think that Russia is a terrorist state, as President Zelensky says? Russia started a very brutal aggression against Ukraine. A lot of people are dying in Ukraine, the citizens, men, women, children, elderly people. And this is what we call a really brutal, unjustified war that, has, that uh, Russia started. And we have to do all to support Ukraine and uh, to give Ukraine the chance to defend its own integrity and sovereignty. And uh, that is what we are doing when we support the country. Mm -hmm. But calling it a terrorist state, in your view, doesn't achieve anything? It achieves something when we support the Ukraine with all the financial means we give to the Ukraine, with all the humanitarian aid, with all the weapons we deliver. And we will continue doing this as long as it is necessary for supporting Ukraine and for avoiding that the outcome of this war is what Putin is looking for, a dictated peace. And this is something that neither the Ukraine nor we will accept. So it is necessary that we continue with this very strong support. And it is necessary that we also continue with all the sanctions we imposed on Russia. And this is an important aspect from my, as I see it. We imposed sanctions against, on Russia, after the annexion of Crimea. Not too many, but we did. Back in 2014. And they are still in place. We imposed sanctions against Russia when they organized the uprise in the east of Donbas in Ukraine. And they are still in place. And all the very heavy sanctions we impose on Russia now will be there if there is not a real fair peace from the perspective of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And this is the message I sent to Putin and many others do the same. And we make it very clear, you cannot look for a dictate peace against Ukraine. When you speak to Putin, does he acknowledge the sanctions? Does he acknowledge how much his economy has been hurt? Or does he just not care? I think he cares, but he will not really admit it. So you get some because it idea, hasn't stopped him. You get some idea that it really is hurting him and that he understands the deep impacts of our sanctions on his economy. And uh, I'm always mentioning it because it's necessary to say it. Uh, just to give you a view on this question, if a very advanced country like the United States or Germany with a very progressive economy with high-tech industries would go out of the world and would just stick to itself, we would go down in economic growth very, very soon. Mm -hmm. But this is now happening to a country that is not that advanced, that is really needing all the technologies from the rest of the world for having a similar standard of living and for having the chance to be part of a growth in the world economy. And this is now the real damage to the Russian economy that they have no chance to do this and it's also hurting them because many of the things, even the military weapons they produce themselves are in one or the other way um, just linked to the economic and technological progress of the world and so they will go back very very far. When will Russia no, when will Russia no longer have the ability to continue this fight? When will Putin run out of weapons, run out of funds, or can he, this continue for years? No one really knows. He has, uh, he is, he is uh, the head, the leader of a very great country with uh, a lot of people living there, with uh, a lot of means, and he is really doing this brutal war with, uh, and, and he prepared for it very long. I think the decision to, to do this war was taken one year before it started or possibly earlier because he prepared for it. And so he will be able to continue with the war really a long time. But this is the message we say to him. We are able to support the Ukraine as long as necessary for defending its sovereignty, the democracy, the rule of law, and all the things the people in Ukraine are looking for. President Zelensky has said that he would like to see the war end by the end of the year. How does it end? And is that realistic? It is very 
difficult to judge whether this is realistic because this is something that is decided on the ground. And even more, is this one of the reasons why we are so active supporting U the Ukraine with all the different uh, means I already discussed on financial, humanitarian support, sanctions, and delivery of weapons. So Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been called a 9-11 moment for Europe, a big wake-up call. Do you think that Europe and do you think Germany was just too complacent for too long? I think too many in the world were hoping that we are living in a different world that is different to the experience of the last century and the centuries before where might and power were deciding on the future of countries and not the, the rules and the agreements we have between states. And we have had an agreement that uh, there should be no attempt to change territory, to, to, to change borders, to, to invade the neighbor. Mm -hmm. And this agreement is now cancelled by Putin. And this is what I called um, Zeitenwende in German, a watershed moment of, of uh, international politics. Peace is at danger, and this is why it is absolutely necessary that we spend more for defense, and Germany is going in the lead in this question in Europe. So it was too complacent? I think we should have uh, be prepared for that situation, and uh, but it is really a big, big disaster for the expectations of all of us looking at peace. The, the, the chances we have in the world are better if there is no attempt to change borders with war and things like that. But now we are in that situation and we have to be realistic and what this is why we have to s do more. But what is the fundamental nature of this conflict? Because uh, the head of the British Army called it a 1937 moment. Is that how you see it? Is that the moment in history we are in right now? I think this is uh, a moment where we have to make absolutely clear that we are strong enough that no one should just think about attacking, for instance, NATO territory. And this is why I said to my parliament that we are ready and willing to defend uh, e any centimeter, every centimeter of uh, NATO territory in, in Europe, and that we are together with our allies. And this is a very clear message to our and Eastern that's allies. That's a clear message. That's a clear line. But there are plenty of territories around Russia that aren't members of NATO. Do you think Vladimir Putin has his goal set as going into Moldova or surrounding countries? Let me just stick one second to what I already said. Because of this, I decided to, uh, to, to establish an extra uh, budget for spending mm -hmm. the military, 100 billion euros, and that we will increase our spending up to approximately 2% all the years in the to come. And this will really create an army that has the strongest funding between the NATO allies in Europe. And this is what we are sticking to, and we will continue to do this. Which was a big change for Germany. This is something where we are acting realistically in, in a different time now. Mm -hmm. And w this is necessary to do it. What is Putin thinking of? He is thinking like the imperialists in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. He is thinking that all about a nation is power and that if you are mighty enough, you can just take territory of your neighbors. And this is an activity and an idea we cannot accept and we will not accept. And this is why we are so strong on this question. He was always very, very critical about NATO and the European Union. And uh, when I talked to him, I said, you have to accept the European Union and that a big alliance of democratic states is building a very strong federal group of states, the union, a union aside mm -hmm. of you. And he was very much thinking about NATO. And I told him NATO is not aggressive. It's just about defense. But he thinks he has just to spend all the money he earns for, the, for his uh, military abilities and sometimes using it. And this is what should fail now. And this is why we are doing the right thing when we support the Ukraine. Do you believe that Vladimir Putin will stop at Ukraine? I think that all what we do will help to give him the view that this is not working and that he will not be successful. Mm -hmm. 
So open question on that. When it comes to NATO territory, you now have these two new members, Finland and Sweden, potentially joining the alliance. It looks like they will. Will Vladimir Putin view that as provocative, as more of a threat? All wondered what, how he would react to the application of Finland and Sweden for NATO. But uh, in the end, he accepted it. This is how I see it. And uh, he has to because it is the decision of these countries that they want to join and it is our decision that we take them because they are really much fitting to the concept of NATO democratic states that uh, are very strong with their own activities in defense mm -hmm. and uh, this will strengthen the alliance. Let me ask you about Germany. Um, your country has earned this reputation of over-promising and under-delivering when it comes to Ukraine. You know that. You've heard that criticism. Ukraine received its very first delivery of German howitzers, its artillery, last week. Why did it take that long? We're in the fifth, fifth month. So we took a very, very hard decision to change political strategies we followed for many decades, right. never to deliver weapons into a country that is in a conflict. And when we decided, when I decided to change that practice of our country, a lot of other European countries followed. And this made it mm -hmm. that a group, big group of countries are now supporting the Ukraine with weapons and do the best. Germany sent all the weapons we had our, our stocks and our military um, infrastructure. And we decided also to deliver new weapons from our industry, which takes a longer time because they have to be produced. But we did all these things and we continue to do so. And when we decided, for instance, to send the most modern howitzer, which you can buy on mm -hmm. the world market, which is in use in Germany, um, it was very difficult to organize that this could be used in the war because you have to have some training. And we had Ukrainian soldiers in Germany and when the training ended in the end they came with the weapon with uh, with the howitzers to Ukraine and they but are now the United used. States is doing that they're providing weaponry within 48 hours sometimes of the president signing and carrying out training why I did it take this long for Germany I think you should understand that there is a difference if a country like the United States uh, spends that much for defense which mm -hmm. is a very big uh, investment mm -hmm. and you have a lot of uh, weapons at your stocks the how it's as many other countries delivered to ukraine were not the mo most modern one but they were at the stocks so we had to do this and this is how we are continuing you should know we are doing right this things which are necessary for helping now in this very situation in the east of ukraine and this is why we sent the weapons that were necessary and that are necessary there together with the united states and the United Kingdom, we decided to deliver um, multi-rocket launches to Ukraine now, which are- Those haven't been delivered yet. We are sending them and we are doing it with the means and ways we have and with the training. And once again, I th there are a lot of very experienced people who yesterday looked at Google and today they know how to th do things. But I will tell you there are weapons where you have to have your training and you have, it, have to have it uh, not in Ukraine, you have to have it here in, in our countries. And so mm -hmm. the soldiers have to come to get the training and they are doing it. This is what we do with many other things. And if you look at this, what we are sending from a perspective on, of uh, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks from now, you will always see that Germany is one of the countries that is doing the most because what we are sending now is the most sophisticated technology you can mm -hmm. use. There is also anti ballistic uh, there are also uh, weapons we give to the uh, to the ukraine that they can defend the air uh, the anti-aircraft missiles you the promised the uh, radar no, no, no they, they can defend a city from against uh, the uh, rockets and missiles mm -hmm. that were sent there from putin and this is very expensive and very effective technology but they will get it when? And this will help a country like odessa uh, to support to, to defend the country a city like Odessa or Kiev. But I, I ask you when, because you know that the delays have led to speculation, that it's not about 
getting the supplies. It's about the will of the government to actually deliver them. Um, and whether there's fear of provoking Putin or whether it's years of budget cuts to your defense industry and to your defense budget that have made it just not possible for the German military to act quickly. How do you respond to that? Those who are looking to the facts see that we are doing what is feasible and that we are doing the same things as our allies are doing and that we are using all the means we really have. And uh, when you compare what we are delivered to the Ukraine and compare it with activities of others, you will find that we are very much aligned with all the others. But the most important thing is that we are not just now supporting Ukraine, we are changing the way how we spend money for defense. And mm -hmm. this is the big increase which will change the situation and will give us the chance to be more quick in reaction to a threat that is coming to NATO, the alliance or to our country. And this is why I decided to do this, to do this and I will continue to follow this policy, making Germany strong enough for being the partner all our alliance allies in Europe are looking for and or allies in the transatlantic partnership. But you're moving as fast as you can? We will move as fast as we can and we are doing. I want to ask you about um, German finances. Do you know how much right now Germany is spending on Russian energy? It's decreasing the money we are spending and this is why we are well, we have decided to change all the uh, imports we have from fossil resources. Um, different to the United States, we are not producing them ourselves. We mm -hmm. have to import them, and we get them from many places of the world, but we, we decided to go out of the import of fossil resources from Russia. And we did so with the import of coal, which is not that difficult because we already imported mm -hmm. most of it from other places. We decided so to do so with the import of oil, and we will go out of this imports in the end of this year, which is also something which is now we are preparing for and which is from some region. Uh, if we just uh, if we look at the whole country, will be will be relatively easy because oil is shipped, and we are also working on some refineries in the east of Germany that are not. Uh, getting the oil by ship, so we are making this feasible for right. them also. And uh, then we are, we decided that we will build pipelines to the shores of the north of Germany for importing LNG. Mm -hmm. This is... Liquefied natural gas. Liquefied natural, natural gas, and this is something I was looking for even when I was the mayor of Hamburg, because I thought it could be useful to have always the, the ability to change the the suppliers f of your uh, of, of, of what you buy from, from uh, in, in, in case of gas. When we looked and this at is the numbers, why we are though, now doing it. Hmm? When when we looked at the numbers, Germany is providing about two billion in aid to Ukraine. That's roughly what you spend per month on gas from Russia, on coal, on energy supplies. So while you're helping the Ukrainians financially, you're also essentially giving Vladimir Putin a financial lifeline. He cannot buy anything from the money he's, he's getting from us because he, will, he has all these sanctions on imports for modern technologies and things he is looking for. So this is what is making very angry. But to be very clear, when we decided on sanctions together and with all our allies, we said always we will do it in a way that we harm Putin more than us. Mm -hmm. And many countries in Europe are depending for historical reasons and because they are near to the place and it is the nearest place to get the gas on the imports of gas. And when now whole Europe is deciding to go out of this uh, dependence, this right. will change the scenario even on the world market. But Vladimir Putin can use that money elsewhere, uh, just not in the West. But so he cannot buy Is it still two billion a month that Germany is sending to Russia? It is always decreasing. And I once again say that we decided that we do the same that we draft the sanctions in a way that they hurt Putin, and this is what we do. And once again, we are now doing real investments into technology, in pipelines, in ports. Mm -hmm. And I know there are people that sometimes think that uh, when you are having taken a decision one afternoon, the next morning you have a port and a 40 kilometers pipeline. Oh, it takes but time. in the real t life, this is not happening. But what we did is deciding on legislation 
we already did, which makes it easy to build these pipelines with own, uh, without any legal restrictions in the shortest time to come. Mm -hmm. And we really hope that the first of them will be able to work in the beginning of the next year. And if you see that things like this usually take two, three, four, five years, and we do it in possibly six months or a bit more in the first, uh, in with the first pipelines that are going to work, you see that we are very, very strong in doing the necessary things for making us independent. And uh, this also is, and, but let me add this, when Europe is deciding to go out of the import of, of gas from Russia, mm -hmm. this will have consequences. It'll have, I mean, this is the equivalent of them declaring war on you this by is cutting gas supplies to Germany. This isn't just your choice. They're using that as a weapon against you. This is obviously the case, and this is why I was starting to discuss the question what to do if the gas delivery will be reduced right when I entered office. Mm -hmm. It was my political decision to say that I want to know exactly what we have to do for in case of that, and this is why we are not prepared for years, but prepared since I am the chancellor of this country. And this is why I was able, after the war started, to go to the parliament and say, we will build these pipelines. Mm -hmm. We will build these new ports for liquefied natural gas. And just to repeat this, when whole Europe in some years will be not dependent on the gas from Russia, it will get gas from other places. But this is altogether more than 150, nearly 160 billion cubic meters of gas right. that is now as a new request coming to the world market. And this is one of the reasons why we should be very much prepared that we will have high, high energy prices all over the world in all countries because of the fact that the gas that Russia is now supplying will to a certain extent, which we will un understand in, in some years, will not be able to be sold. Mm -hmm. And so we have to get it from other resources. But this is a very tough time for global economy when we it do is. this change. It is, and you run the largest economy in Europe. What happens in Germany matters to the rest of the world. So if you are looking at gas supplies, potential shortages, you could have freezing homes. You could have shuttered factories. Have you decided when and which industries you prioritize? Which factories get shuttered first? We prepare for the situation of having that uh, difficulties may come up because of the energy supply. And this is why we decided to uh, make new legislation on storage capacities for gas, legislation that is uh, forcing the participants of the market that there should be 90% in the storage st storage capacities of Germany in the at the beginning of winter. And this is now already taking place and the storages are becoming, um, are, are now filled more than they were one year ago at that time. We also decided to change legislation that we make it possible to say we will not use that many gas at in the summer, for instance, and we will use um, coal plants for producing electricity. And so a lot of decisions are already taking and we are preparing ourselves for a very difficult situation, as many other European countries do, and, and obviously countries all over the globe are doing thinking about what might come up. When will you have to start rationing natural gas and will you have to shut down factories in the months ahead? I think we will see how things are now moving, how things are, how, how the development will be in the future. What we can do at this time is mm -hmm. preparing ourselves for being ready to take the necessary decisions. And this is what we do. And we are all the time preparing with the necessary legislation that we are able to do what is necessary and not just looking for what we could do if we would have the right legal framework. We will have it when it's necessary. So Germany's uh, heavy industry association, BDI, warned a halt in Russian gas deliveries would make recession inevitable. The World Bank economists say it's going to be very hard to avoid a recession. Is it inevitable? It is not. An, it will be very tough if we will have uh, a shortage of energy supplies. 
obviously all our countries, all our, li all, all our life is depending on, on the supply of energy. And uh, obviously a lot of countries, the most countries of the world are depending on the supply from abroad. And so we have to prepare for a difficult situation. And as I explained to you very detailed, mm -hmm. we are preparing and we are prepared. But you are still preparing for energy prices to stay high for years? How long? I'm sure that this will be a time where the energy prices will be high all over the globe because of the request. And this is one reason why we accelerate our way out of the use of fossil mm -hmm. resources. You should know that Germany decided that we will be a CO2 neutral country in 2045, which is less okay. than 25 years. And this means that we are now expanding the production of electricity and of en with uh, offshore wind, with onshore wind, with solar energy, that we are expanding the investment into our grid so that we are able to have a completely different industry doing steel, doing chemistry, doing uh, producing cement with uh, the use of electricity and hydrogen in the mm -hmm. end. And so we are just going faster into the better world we are already looking for. Right, but inflation is crushing standards of living around the world. Um, Vladimir Putin is, is weaponizing inflation. He's weaponizing food. Is he right to bet that he can fracture the Western alliance by making it harder for Europeans and Americans and everyone else to afford food in these months ahead? You are very right. The shortages of food many people in the world are seeing now as a threat to them are the direct consequence of Ru Russia's aggression against Ukraine and the war he is imposing on the country. You are right that uh, all the rising energy prices are also a direct consequence of his doing. And he is, he is the one that is, is doing the wrong things. And we are always discussing this with our partners on the globe. We are starting an initiative to support countries that have not enough food with food. We're supporting the general secretary in finding a way how to get out all the wheat out of Ukraine. How? Through the war, war. He is discussing intensely on ways how this could happen, not just with trains, what we are organizing together with the Ukrainians, but also with shipping. But this is something where we will find in the next one or two weeks if an agreement between uh, Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, the United Nations will be feasible. Do you really think back that Vladimir Putin is going to allow grain to be shipped out of Ukraine? He's shut down the Black Sea ports. This is a really powerful weapon against the West. Why would he give that up? Why would he agree to let the grain out? There is one question the General Secretary is asking to all and also to Putin. Will you be responsible and the one that is responsible that uh, there is the wheat that is necessary in, in Africa, in Asia, and other places is not going there. And so this is why he is working so hard to find a solution and we are supporting him. But you Once again, mm -hmm. I think we will face a situation of high prices and we will face a very difficult situation. But this we knew right from the beginning when we decided to support Ukraine. And now it is necessary that we stand united and the outcome of this NATO meeting here in Madrid, the outcome of uh, the G7 meeting we had in Germany in Elma, and the outcome of all the meetings we had in the European Union is we stand united, we are united, and he will not be able to fracture us. If you can't reopen the Black Sea ports, if Putin doesn't agree to let the food out of Ukraine, how do you lower global food prices? We are now collecting money for supporting the poorest countries that they will be able to deliver food to their people and this is our international initiative we we organize together with others for food security and we will continue to do that but it risks global instability it is a real problem and it is a real consequence of putin's war and this is why it is even more necessary that we support the people so it also puts pressure to end this conflict sooner what is your timeline for when this can end? The 
conflict will end when Putin understands that he will not be successful with this idea to just to conquer part of the territory of its neighbor. He controls 20% of Ukraine right now, according to U.S. intelligence. This is why we are supporting Ukraine with financial means, with humanitarian aid, but also with arms deliveries, and why we are doing our sanctions regime together on Putin. So it, it has been... Um a hard lesson to learn, but as you've laid out here, you know, members of the German government have admitted it was a mistake to be so dependent on Russia for so long. I wonder, do you look at that and wonder about China and see the same type of risk that the West is so financially intertwined with Beijing that it poses a threat, a direct threat? Coming back to the first uh, aspect of your question, I think it was not right that we were not prepared to have at any time the chance to change the one that is delivering gas, oil and coal to us. So we should have invested all over Europe in an infrastructure that gives us the ability to change the supply mm -hmm. from one day to the other. And I think this is the lesson that has been learned in Europe and in many other places that you have to be prepared, be prepared for a situation like this. And this is also the answer to all the other questions coming up. If, For instance, if you look uh, to China, it is more the answer, just understand that you should have supply chain imports, not just from one or two countries, but from many. Mm -hmm. And that even your business is looking for many other countries. So. The answer to what we are discussing with China is not to go away from China. The answer is to go to the other Asian countries. And there are very, very big nations which I think we have to look at. And it was very good f when we at G7 came together with the leaders of Indonesia and India, for instance. And they are representing two very strong nations, nations with a good and important future in the world to come. And uh, if we look around them, we find many others. And so the answer we all together should give is just do your business with many countries mm -hmm. so that you can live with a situation when trouble comes up with one. And trouble may come up with China. I mean, the United States sees it as a threat. Does Germany see China as a threat? I think. I think the world we are going to live in 2050 will be multipolar. Many countries will be important. The United States, Russia, China, the European Union and the uh, countries in this union, but also Indonesia and India or South Africa, countries mm -hmm. from the South of America. And the big task of all of us is to make this world not just multipolar with many influential countries looking to, 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 to have to, 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 to looking for their own interests and what what is useful for them but making it a world that is working together so multipolar is not enough multilateral working together for a better future this is what we are should what we should aim for and it is now the time to work for that right. better future when we are looking at the midst of this century we are in you are being diplomatic there uh, NATO in this latest statement identified China as a, as a threat. The Secretary General said it poses challenges to our values, to our interest, and to our security. Does that mean the West is on a path for a clash with Beijing? No, and exactly if we look at the deci decisions we took here and we are working on, it is that we are just aware of problems that might come up and we are aware of these problems because we are democracies and we are uh, not an aggression to neighbors to, to the rest of the world and we are not aggressive against them. And but China we, might be towards Taiwan? But we, and this is why we say that we are working for a world where aggression is not working and this is why we are making our alliance strong but this is also why we say developing a strat strategy that gives us the chance to be not dependent and I come back to what I said. Part of this answer is to look at many other countries in the world that will be strong in the future and make them their partner, our partners, especially when they are democracies. And mm -hmm. this is, I think, the strategy we should follow. I'm told we are running out of time. Before I let you go, 
President Biden also talks about this potential conflict between democracies and autocracies. Is that the biggest threat on the horizon? What keeps you up at night? First, I, I think the democracies are very strong and they, because they have the support of their people, they are really having also the future on their side. We should be, we should look at these things from this perspective. But we should be clear about the threats that are coming to, to our future. And this is coming from autocracies, yes, mm -hmm. because they tend to be aggressive. And this is an aspect we should be very much aware of, and I am. And this is why I organized our meeting we had in, in Germany with the D7 group of democratic, eco economically successful democratic states, that we invite partners from all over the globe that are also democracies for making it happen that the democracies are strong. Mm -hmm. And by strong, it also comes with 100,000 US troops in Europe and 300,000 NATO response forces in Europe. This isn't just diplomacy, this is muscle. This is, and it's necessary. All right. Mr. Chancellor, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. I appreciate it.